In this video, we are going to look into further examples of how to use recursion and looping strategies to implement iteration. That is, um, executing code repeatedly. And uh, we are going to use an example that you all know from your high school math, which is called the factorial. So let's start a new file and uh, rename it into simply factorial. And um, so now, before we uh, go into the coding part, I would say, let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples to review your math knowledge. And uh, now in the markdown cell, I'm going to use a couple of times in this video and also in the next couple of videos, the dollar symbols. And basically what uh, I use them for is um, that the formulas that are included are formatted in a nice way, just as you know it uh, from, um, yeah, academic uh, journals and so on. It's a language called LaTeX, but you don't need to know this language for this course. So let's go, go ahead and look at an example. Let's look at the example of three factorial written like this. So what is three factorial? Well, it is the product of the numbers from one through, th uh, through three. So some of you may learn this as follows. Some of you learned it as one times two times three, which uh, of course is six. Okay, that is three factorial. Some other people uh, watching this video may have learned it the other way around. So three times two times one, which is of course the same um, as one times two times three. It's perfectly symmetrical. So it really depends probably on your high school teacher um, on uh, which way uh, you prefer. But uh, we are going to see that um, these are two different ways of viewing the same problem. And depending on how we view the problem, um, a, a different strategy when coding may be more intuitive than the other, okay? But now let's um, go further into, um, into the mathematical discussion, so to say. So let's also go ahead and now try to generalize this expression. So um, one thing that um, I always was confused with in high school was, um, what is the factorial of zero? Well, your high school teacher will have told you probably that it is defined to be one. And note how I use the colon equals and not simply the equals, because I'm simply saying zero factorial is defined to be one, okay? So it is not like, there is no calculation for this to, to derive that. It is really a definition by mathematicians and it is a, a very smart definition, of course, okay? And so just like um, mathematicians define zero factorial to be one, what they also do is, they define factorial in a general way like this. So they say n factorial, and n factorial is defined usually um, as n times, and then in parentheses, you write n minus one, and then after the parentheses, you have the factorial symbol again, okay? This is usually um, what you um, see um, in, a, in a good math course, right? So um, I know that sometimes, um, especially in high school when the teacher does not want to get too theoretical, what um, they sometimes do is they go ahead and write it like this. They write n times n minus one times dot 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 times one and that's it, okay? So sometimes math teachers also write it like this. This is probably more familiar, but um, note how um, the part up here the first part, so the n times n minus one factorial part, this is really the formula that is important. And technically speaking, this is also just a definition, okay? So in other words, um, this is what um, a mathematician would define. And now let me also remove uh, the second half. I only included this uh, to show you a more familiar picture um, so that you um, have an easier time understanding uh, what this formula means. But this is really the, uh, the generic um, definition of a factorial, okay? So maybe let's go ahead and say in general, okay? Okay, so that is a concrete example and that is the generic rules. So now why is it that important um, to derive those generic rules? Well, what we can see here is basically the pattern of a recursion in the mathematical de definition. So how do we see that? Well, if we look at the second line where I say n factorial is defined to be n times n minus one factorial, what am I really doing here? What are mathematicians doing here? Well, they're basically defining the factorial of a number, of a number n, in terms of the factorial itself, okay? 
So see how the exclamation mark, the factorial operator, so to say, is on both sides of the definition, on the left-hand side and also on the right-hand side. So I'm defining an operation in terms of itself. And that is just the definition of a recursion, because in an earlier video we saw that a recursion is just a function that calls itself and has a way out. So where is the way out? Well, the way out is, of course, the, the first case here. Zero factorial is defined to be one. In this case, so when I'm calculating the factorial of the number zero, I just know it's, it's one by definition. I don't have to do any calculation. That is usually what we refer to in, in a recursion as the base case. It is the way out, okay? So let's see how we can take um, our knowledge from a recursion from the previous video when we talked about a simple countdown um, and how can we apply the recursion um, strategy to, to model a factorial. Okay, so now let's go ahead and now um, let's write a function. So let's call the function simply factorial. Of course, the function takes one parameter. Let's call it n also because it's a natural number, so it makes sense to call it n. And let's also write a nice doc string. So let's say calculate the factorial of a number. And um, now let's go ahead and also uh, specify the arguments that the function takes. It's going to be an n, it's going to be an integer, and it's simply the number to calculate the factorial for. And now that is a big difference to um, the recursions we saw in the previous video. Now, of course, we are going to have a return value and the return value is also going to be an integer and it's simply the factorial, okay? So oftentimes um, I have a hard time to find a, a nice name for what I'm going to write here in the returns part. Well, often what you do is simply, simply copy paste whatever the name of the function is, okay? So you, the function takes an n, it gives us back the factorial of n. Both the input and the output are an integer, that's important. Um, the factorial function would also work in some circumstances for floating point numbers, but uh, this is mathematically a bit, um, yeah, um, more, uh, more involved, so we're not going to do that in this video. So let's now go ahead and simply translate the mathematical definition of a factorial in Python code as a recursion. So in other words, when, whenever we uh, want to calculate the factorial of zero, we know it is one by definition. So let's write that. So let's simply go ahead and write if n double equals zero, so if the n that is passed in is zero, then we simply return one. Okay, and that is now the, the big difference to the previous example uh, where we modeled uh, a countdown. Now we have a return value, so this function now has actually output. The previous function did not have output. But we're not yet done. So let's go ahead and um, also model the else clause. And now we are going ahead and uh, we have to break down this part here, the, set the, the right hand side of the formal definition here. And let's do the second, uh, the, the right hand side first. So the, the side, what I mean is the right hand operator of the multiplication sign. So let's say the factorial function calls itself with n minus one as the argument. And whatever we get back from this function, we, re we store in a variable, let's call it simply recurse. Okay, I just give it a name, I made that up, okay? So the function in the else clause first goes ahead and calls itself with a decremented argument, decremented by one. It stores the result and then we have to still calculate the overall result of the recursion. And um, let's do that like this. Let's introduce a variable called result and the result is simply n times whatever recurses. Okay, whatever we get back from the factorial function. So n times recurse, this is like n times the recurse side, the recursive step. And then of course, we have to return something. So we're going ahead and we are going to return the result variable. So let's see first if this function works. So in order to check a function, it makes sense um, to uh, think of edge cases. So two edge cases we have to model is of course, the factorial of uh, zero, and this should be one. So let's check. And indeed the function gives us back one, okay? So also let's check um, what is the factorial of one. One is kind of an edge case, right? Kind of, not really, but kind of, it also gives us back one. And let's also go ahead and see what is the factorial of three. So a number that is strictly greater than one. So in other words, now the recursive step will have to ac be executed several times. 
And this basically gives me back six, which is of course also the correct result regarding the example of above here. So now let's um, try to further understand what the recursion does here. And to do so, let's copy paste the code over to Python Tutor. And uh, this will be very helpful. So let's say um, result will be set to factorial and let's also calculate the factorial of three here. And let's also remove the doc string so, so that this becomes a little bit easier to read. Okay, click on visualize execution. Now um, we don't have this white area up here, here where it says print output because we're not using the print function. And usually, just a remark here, usually you never want a function to print something out. Very rarely you want that. So usually a function takes input and it returns some output that we then uh, go on and do some further processing with. So let's see what, how, how the recursion works here. First step, the factorial function is defined. Okay, so the entire def statement is run as a whole. This creates a new uh, name in the global scope called factorial, that references an object, and the object here contains the entire code that is in the code block here. Let's call the function. This creates a new function scope where n is set to three, and now the function begins to run from top to bottom, and because n is three, the if condition is of course false, and the function will go right into the else, else clause. And now comes something interesting. The first line in the else clause is recurse is set to the return value of factorial of n minus one. So we know that the assignment statement is basically evaluated such that the right hand side is run first. So the name recurse is not even read, so to say. So right hand side is run first. What this is, it's another function call to the same function. So this will create another scope. Okay, where n is now two. Okay, so far we haven't even multiplied. Okay, so next what, what's going to happen is the next function call, so the first function call is now waiting on the second function call to return some result. Now the second function call is go gonna start from top again. So this, the first function call is pausing at, the fir at this first line in the else clause. The second function call starts from, to run from top to bottom again. So let's do that. And of course, the if condition is still false because n is greater than zero. So what we do is the recursive step is done a second time. So let's go ahead. What this will do is it will simply create another function scope where n is now set to one. And now the second function call is waiting for the third function call. n is one, that means the first condition is still not true. So we go into the else clause one more time. And now we will uh, also execute the right-hand side of the assignment statement one more time. This will create another function scope where n is set to zero. And now something interesting happens. So the first time something interesting happens. So now the if condition is true. And that means this function call down here where n is set to zero, this will now return one, okay? And that means the return statement is executed. And this will now, as we see here, create the return value of this function scope and is set to one. And the return value is the only thing, the only object that is going to survive after this function sco uh, scope is um, basically removed. Okay, so Python automatically removes all the function scopes of functions that are done and everything inside the function scope, all the names, all the, all the objects that are referenced by variables inside the, the local scope are going to be removed, going to be garbage collected. The only thing that survives is the return value. And that is different to the previous video where we modeled the countdown function. And in the countdown case, we did not have a return statement and therefore we automatically had a return value of none, the special object none, but here we have a return value, in this case one. So what happens with this one? The one is going to be returned to the previous function call where n was set to one. And the previous function call is still waiting at this line here. The line recurs is going to be set to the return value of factorial of n minus one. And this is exactly what's going to happen. The one that is returned from the lower most function scope is now going to be set to the recurse variable. And now this function call, the second to last one, so to say, um, is now going to going ahead with its calculations. So in the next line, um, n times recurse is calculated. And n times recurse in this ca case would be one times one. And one times one is simply one again. So let's go one step further. We get a new variable called result, which is now set to one. Okay, next line is going to be executed, return result and return result will simply return this one, okay? That means this function scope also has a return value. And now in the next step, 
this one here, which is the same as the one of the result here, this one is going to be returned to the, to the function scope before that is still waiting. And the other objects, as I said before, will totally be uh, gone, right? This will be um, garbage collected. So this one, the return value coming from the result variable will simply go one step up and become there, of course, the recurse variable because the second function call where n was set to two is still at this line here, okay? So it was still waiting all the time, okay? There were two further function calls, but in all the time, it was waiting at this line here. And now it's going to continue. It's also going to con uh, calculate n times recurse. And this time it is two times one, and two times one gives me two, of course. And this result is now going to be returned as the return value. So everything is now going to be lost except for the return value. The two is going to move upwards and it becomes the recurse variable. So now we have recurse as two and n is three. And now in this function scope, the very first one that we started, now the result variable is going to be calculated n times recurse. This is going to be six, of course, and the six is going to be returned and it's going to be st uh, stored into a global variable called result. That's what we do here. And all the function scopes go away, okay? So let's briefly recap. When we start from the, brief from the beginning, we first create the function and then we make one function scope for the initial function call. And then what's going to happen is we get further function scopes, that is the recursion, and all of them now have a return value. And the previous function call will always wait until the return value comes back. And then it will use it to calculate its result, its return value. And then its return value is going to be returned to the previous function call. And this is uh, again how recursion works. But now the, the big difference again being now we have return values. Okay, so let's go back to JupyterLab and um, simplify this function a little bit. So one thing that we can simplify is the following. Here we are going ahead and we are calculating um, some something using the recursive step, the recursive function call. And the result of that is stored into a variable recurse and the re variable recurse is only used in the next line for multiplication. So one way to simplify this is as follows. We could simply go ahead and um, copy or basically uh, cut the, the function call and simply overwrite the recurse variable. And this makes the recurse variable basically redundant. We don't need it, okay? We can simply remove it. Similarly speaking, now we set the result of this expression of n times factorial n minus one. We set that to the result variable in the local scope we don't need this. We could actually simply go ahead and um, cut this out, put this after the return line and simply get rid of the result variable. Okay, let's see if it's still, if still everything works and we get the same results. Okay, so let's quickly see um, what is the big difference in Python Tutor here. So um, this here would be n times and uh, let's copy paste down the factorial here and let's get rid of the two variables here. So this is what it looks like. If we execute this um, version now, the only difference is, so we get the our first initial function call where n is set to three. This will jump into the else clause and the else clause executes the return n times factorial of n minus one. So uh, the expression on the right hand side of the return has to be evaluated first. And n times can only be executed if we know what the return value of this is. So in other words, the right hand side of the multiplication is going to be executed first, which creates another function scope. Okay, so now the same happens as before. We get the same couple of function scopes as we did previously. And now when we call factorial with n set to zero, what this does is it will simply return one right away. Okay, and what happens to the one? Well, the one is in the previous function call, it's simply used as the return value basically of factorial of n minus one. And then basically the next, the previous function call simply goes ahead and returns the result of n times whatever we got back. So in other words, we don't have any temporary variables here anymore, but simply we jump right from return value to return value. So the functions return a bit quicker. We don't have temporary variables. Other than that, nothing has changed. And now let's um, make one more simplification that is um, maybe not so easy to understand at first, but then it's um, again, uh, rather easy. So in chapter two, when we introduced the concept of functions, all the functions we saw there only had one return statement. That is different in this function call or in this function definition. Here we have two return statements. So in, the, in chapter two, the return statement was always in the last line of the function. Okay, we calculated something and then the function returned the result. 
here um, we have two return statements because we have two cases. We have the base case and we have the, the recursive case. So now what you need to know is whenever a function call hits the return statement, this particular function call is over right away. The thing that is after the return statement is going to be ret returned, but the function is, is done right away. In other words, whenever the if condition is true and we go into the uh, line where it says return one, anything that, came be, that comes after it, let's say, for example, I make three dots here, any code that comes after it will not be executed anymore. The function is done after it hits the return statement. Therefore, anything also that would be after the if statement down here would also not be executed if the condition is true. That's the, the reason here, okay? In other words, what we could do is, we could do the following. I could simply go ahead and remove the else clause and simply unindent the um, return n times n, my, um, n times factorial n minus one and write it like this. For now, I simply keep an empty line to make it a bit um, easier to read. So in other words, this lower return statement is now only executed if this condition here, the n equals zero condition is false. Because if it is true, then we hit the return statement and as we just learned, anything after return statement is not executed, right? Once we hit the return statement, the function is done. So in other words, we can actually also um, take out this empty line and use the function just like this. And uh, this function does exactly the same as before. And now something remarkably is to, to see, to be seen. So here we have the mathematical definition of a recursion, the base case and the recursive case. And down here, I have the implementation Python, which is basically the closest you can get with code to math world. So here we have the base case. We have to check for the condition is n uh, zero. If so, the, the result is one. Otherwise, the result is the result of n factorial is whatever n times n minus one factorial is. And this basically the second line n times n minus one factorial is basically the same as this n times factorial of n minus one. Okay, so this is as close as we can get with code to a mathematical definition. Okay, so that is solving um, the factorial function, uh, the factorial problem using a recursive approach. And now let's also in this video talk about the alternative way because when I started this chapter, chapter four, I said iteration, so the idea of executing code repeatedly can be achieved using two different strategies. One of them is recursion. The other one is of course looping. So um, let's um, go ahead and say alternative with looping. So now the question is, um, what can we do or how can we model the same problem here using a loop? Well, this is rather easy to do. So one thing you see is when, I, let's, when we look at the example of three factorial, we see that the answer to three factorial is either three times two times one or it is one times two times three. No matter how, which way we view it, um, it basically, um, we can view it either way and both are correct. So in other words, if I see the, the sequence one, two, three, well, this is basically a range ob object here, right? So let's say, let's maybe go down here. If I write range from one to four, and let's say maybe I go ahead and put the list constructor around it, this gives me the numbers one, two, three. And all I want to do is I want to multiply them together, okay? So let's go ahead and instead of using the list constructor, we, we loop over that. So we say for i in range one through four, for now let's say print i. This gives me um, the numbers on a line on their own, but now I want to um, basically multiply them together. So what can we do with that? Uh, what can we do to achieve that? So in our very first Python example um, in this course, in chapter one, we basically um, use the for loop to sum up all the even numbers, if you remember. And um, there, what we did is we initialized the variable called total to zero. And then in the for loop, we simply added up all the even numbers. So now let's do something very similar. So let's go ahead and introduce a variable, let's call it product. And let's initialize it with not, not zero, but one. And the reason why is because one is the neutral element of multiplication. So whatever we multiply with one doesn't change. And now let's go ahead and inside the for loop, let's go ahead and say uh, for every i in this range, we go ahead and we we'll say the new product, the updated product is the old product 
times i. And then at the end, let's simply look at uh, product, what it is, and indeed it is also six, okay? So this approach um, is now the looping approach with which we use to sa uh, solve the same problem. So let's go ahead and make this a function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste um, the uh, header from the function above. Let's go ahead, put it right here. Let's indent everything into the function body. Let's rename the function into factorial loop so that we have a different name for it. And uh, now we have to parameterize uh, this here. So um, what we have to do is we have to replace the four with something with an N here, okay? Because we have to not loop until uh, four or three in this case, but we have to loop um, until N. However, we want to include the N, okay? So let's say I leave it for now with just N here in the, in the range built in. And let's say below the for loop, I'm simply going to return the product as the result. If I now go ahead and call the factorial loop function with three, I only get two, not six. And the reason why is because I'm only looping over the numbers one and two here, okay? I'm not looping over three. If I pass in three for n, then as we learned, um, the range built in only loop, uh, loops from the left side including, but the right hand side, the second argument is excluded. So in other words, what we have to do is we simply have to add one to that, okay? If we add one to n in here, then the factorial function in the looping version also works correctly. And now, um, maybe you are a bit confused of, um, yeah, um, what are we really doing here? But what we can always do is, we can always use the print function inside a, a function and output or print out um, some intermediate steps, so to say. So what I'm going to do is, I'm simply going to print out the, the product. And we do that on, on one line. So let's do it like this. And now what we see is, when I execute the function, we now see how the function basically, or how the product develops. So first the product is one, then I multiply to that the number one because from the range here. And so one times one is simply one. In the next iteration of the loop, um, I'm multiplying uh, two on top of that. So one times two becomes two. So that is why I see the two here. And in the next iteration, I'm going to multiply three with it and two times three will become six. If I go ahead and let's say, if I make this a bit bigger, so let's say I want to calculate the factorial of five, then we see that one times one is one, one times two is two, two times three is six, six times four is 24, and 24 times five gives me 120. So these are the intermediate steps. So this is how you can use the print function within a function definition. If you have troubles, if you get a wrong result and you want to debug the function, then the print function within a function definition um, may be useful to give you out some intermediate steps, but um, usually when you are done, when you know your function is correct, you will go ahead and remove the line again and uh, then make sure that uh, your result is not printed out, but returned, okay? And now if we go ahead and uh, quickly copy paste uh, this uh, second version of the factorial function also into um, Python tutor, and let's also go ahead and call factorial here with uh, three. And also we have to change the name here to factorial then what we are going to see in comparison to the uh, recursive version, um, also maybe one thing I forgot, we have to, so that the result is actually stored, we have to assign it to a variable. What we see is first, in the first step, we are going to create the function object. In the second step, we are going to calculate or we are going to uh, call the function. We get a new function scope where n is set to three. And then within this scope, we get a new uh, variable, which is called product and we assign that one to begin with. And then we are going to run inside the for loop. And inside the for loop, the first time we run, i is set to one. So now we uh, multiply product times one. Okay, this is what we do here, product times one. This gives me a product of one, of course. In the next step, when in the loop here, i becomes two, and then I'm going to um, multiply the product of one times i of two, which gives me a product of two, okay? Because I'm always updating product here. And in the next step, i becomes three and three times two will make the product uh, to be six. And then the six is going to be the return value. And that means these, the object, the number six is going to be returned and all the intermediate variables here inside the function scope, they will be removed, they go away. And the result is that we have the same result as in the recursion approach, okay? But again, in the recursion approach, 
you must not forget you have several function calls in parallel, okay, which all have their own scope. In the looping version, as we saw, at all times we only have one function scope. So in memory, um, using a looping version is in this case, in this scenario, um, easier, um, okay? And um, as we uh, will see in a future video, um, we don't have unlimited memory, of course, so the number of recursive function calls is also limited. So in some problems, um, we uh, can only solve it realistically for realistic input using the looping approach, but uh, for, um, for this example, for the factorial function, as we saw, both the approaches uh, yield exactly the same result, okay? So let's go back to JupyterLab and let's um, briefly um, um, simplify the function also here a bit. So what we can do here is we can go ahead and um, instead of saying product is product times i, what we are going to do is we will simply say product is times equals i and that is the short version for it. That, that is the update version. That is the same as we said product is product times i. Okay, so we see this will do the same if I execute this here. Okay, so that is the comparison um, of the recursion strategy and the looping strategy to solve the factorial problem. And it really depends on how you view the, view the problem, right? If you view it as a looping um, problem, then you basically the looping version is more intuitive for you. But if you know um, a little bit about math and you know the, the definition, this uh, recursive definition, then of course the recursion logic in code is easier to implement. So it really depends on how you personally see the problem. This is um, basically here, it's both approaches are, are comparable. Okay, so um, this is it for this video. If you have any questions, post them in the comments. So I see you in the next video.